Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jared Omernick and joining me a little later in the presentation will be Eric Olkers. We are from SCS Engineers. Today we're going to be talking to you about spill prevention control and countermeasure or SPCC plans and spill response. I'm a civil engineer with over 10 years of experience in environmental consulting and I've prepared SPCC plans for a number of electric utility facilities including power plants, substations, wind farms, solar farms, storage yards, operations facilities, and maintenance garages. Eric is a hydrogeologist with over 27 years of experience and he has completed hundreds of spill responses. Here's an overview of what we're going to go over in the presentation. We're going to give you the basics of the SPCC regulation or the SPCC rule. We're going to talk about who needs an SPCC plan. We're going to talk about the requirements of SPCC plans. We're going to talk about what you can do today to minimize your chances of a spill, and we'll go over some oil handling best management practices. Then we'll talk about what you can do to be prepared for a spill, because they do occur. And then we'll go over some initial spill response steps uh, through some spill scenarios. So here's an introduction to the SPCC rule. It's Code of Federal Regulations, Title 40, Part 112, issued by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. So it's a federal rule. It's commonly referred to as 40 CFR 112. Officially, it's the Oil Pollution Prevention Regulation, uh, but it is commonly referred to as simply the SPCC rule. The rule was initially published in 1973, with major revisions completed in 2002. Some additional revisions in 2008, and the final rule as it sits today uh, was issued in 2009. So really what I want you to take away from this slide is that the regulation is 40 CFR 112. That's what you'll commonly see in plans and um, what you'll hear talked about, and that it's simply referred to oftentimes as the SPCC rule. So what is the rule? Um, the rule was written with the goal uh, to protect navigable waters of the U.S. Um, so really that's protecting the environment and public health. And simply uh, put, it's keeping oil out of our water. So how does the rule do that? The SPCC rule implements requirements for facilities that store over the threshold quantity of oil. So the language of the rule is intentionally broad. So it does allow for flexible implementation, which is a good thing, uh, but it ca can cause some confusion. The rule itself is not very long, but the EPA has an over 900 page guidance document. Uh, so there are a lot of resources out there. There are um, courses that you can take. There are multi-day long courses taught by lawyers, taught by the EPA section chief. Um, so there's some great resources available. Uh, we've got a short presentation here today, so we're really going to give you the basics. Uh, but I do encourage you to seek out some additional references if you're interested. On the previous slide, I mentioned the threshold quantity of oil. The SPCC rule applies to facilities that store more than 1,320 gallons of oil. And that applies to above ground oil storage containers. There are a few exceptions for underground storage, but by and large, the SPCC rule applies to above ground oil storage. And we're talking about containers that are 55 gallons in size or larger. So the SPCC rule does not apply to anything smaller than 55 gallons. And it does apply to oil, uh, which is a broad definition, so there are many types of oil. The most common types of oil that you are likely to see at your facilities include gasoline, diesel, fuel oil, motor oil, used oil, mineral oil, uh, vegetable oil, which FR3 uh, is marketed as environmentally friendly. Uh, it still is oil and still falls under the SPCC rule applicability. Um, but again, there are many other types of oil as well. So what do the regulations require? Uh, the SPCC rule says that you have to write an SPCC plan. The rule says that you need to provide secondary containment for your oil sources. You need to complete regular inspections. 
and you need to complete training for your oil handling personnel. So there are other requirements, but again, we're just covering the basics in this presentation. So what kind of facilities need SPCC plans? Again, it's that 1,320 gallon threshold in containers 55 gallons or greater. So for you, that could mean storage yards where you store spare oil-filled electrical equipment. Could be your maintenance shops or garages where you've got 55 gallon drums, totes, maybe some above ground storage tanks. And of course your substations where you've got your large oil filled equipment, transformers, uh, circuit breakers, and other equipment. So what types of containers are covered by the SPCC plan? So we said 55 gallons or larger, so 55 gallon drums are covered. Intermediate bulk containers, or IBC or polytotes as they're commonly referred to. Oil-filled electrical equipment, including transformers, circuit breakers. And storage tanks, gasoline, diesel, used oil. There are some different categories for containers. There are what's called bulk storage containers, and then there are what's called oil-filled operational equipment and it's an important distinction. So bulk storage containers are there to store the oil. The oil is just sitting there. Whereas for oil-filled operational equipment, the oil is there for a purpose. It's there to support the function of the equipment. So for our used oil tank, uh, that oil is just sitting in the tank. So that's a bulk storage container. For our polytote with FR3 oil, the tote, it's just holding the oil, that is a bulk storage container. For our transformer that has oil in it, there the oil is there to support the function of the transformer, so that's oil-filled operational equipment. A 55-gallon drum is simply storing the oil, so that is a bulk storage container. This is a container that holds oil for a uh, hydraulic lift in a garage. So a hydraulic lift, uh, the oil is there to operate the lift, so that container is oil-filled operational equipment. This is very important because the secondary containment requirements are different for bulk storage containers uh, than they are for oil-filled operational equipment, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. So the rule says that you have to write an SPCC plan. What goes into an SPCC plan? The plan must have a facility diagram, which is a figure or drawing showing the location of each oil storage container. So here's an example of a diagram where each container has a unique name, the capacity is listed, and the type of oil that is in the container is shown. A uh, plan needs to have an oil inventory, including the type of oil and the storage capacity. So this is most commonly a table in the plan. SPCC plans need to include your discharge prevention measures, uh, which is what are you doing to prevent a spill? What kind of policies, what kind of procedures do you have in place uh, to minimize your chances of having a spill in the first place? The SPCC plan needs to include the discharge or drainage controls. So what do you have in place to capture a spill if one does occur? That's your secondary containment. The SPCC plan needs to include your countermeasures for discharge discovery, response, and cleanup. So if you have a spill, what are you going to do? And then the plan needs to include methods of disposal of recovered material. So what are you going to do if you end up with oil-soaked uh, soil, rags, pads, other oil-contaminated items? An SPCC plan also needs to include an emergency contact list. So if something happens, who are you going to call? You need to list a facility emergency coordinator, the go-to person. There's a spill. This person gets notified, and that person knows what to do. The National Response Center, a cleanup contractor. Maybe you can handle some small spills internally. Uh, but if it exceeds your internal capability, you might have to call in an outside contractor to come help you. And then state and local agencies may need to be notified as well. 
and then the plan needs to include uh, spill reporting requirements. So what kind of notifications need to be made if you have a spill? What kind of documentation needs to be done? So the SPCC rule says that your plan has to include in your inspection protocol. And the rule says that you have to inspect in accordance with the written procedures developed by the facility. So the rule itself doesn't say you need to inspect weekly or monthly or quarterly, um, but simply by the rules uh, written for the facility. Uh, the rule does tie in some industry best practices. So if your industry says for a certain type of facility you should inspect it monthly, um, then that's the recurrence interval that you should be following. The SPCC plan needs to include discharge prevention briefings. Uh, that's your training. So your oil handling personnel at least once per year. And then your plan needs to include a discussion on the site security. So what does your facility have um, that helps you control unauthorized access to your oil sources uh, or to prevent vandalism? Do you have security lighting? Do you have a fence around your facility? Maybe it's patrolled by a security guard. Uh, are your fill ports locked on your outdoor tanks? Things like that. So your SPCC plan needs to include discussion on the secondary containment that's provided for your facility's oil sources. And here's where we'll distinguish between, between the bulk storage containers and the oil filled operational equipment. So bulk storage containers need to meet the sized secondary containment requirement. And that means you need to contain the volume of the container plus sufficient freeboard for rainfall. So the rule doesn't say what sufficient freeboard is. So common numbers that you may hear are 110% or 125% or the 25-year storm event. None of that's in the rule. Um, the rule just says sufficient freeboard. Um, and bulk storage containers, that containment needs to be passive. So it needs to be something there in place. So a concrete containment unit or a steel containment unit or a berm, uh, something physically there. Oil-filled operational equipment only needs to meet the general secondary containment requirement. So that means the most likely quantity of oil that would be discharged. And that can either be passive or it can be active. So active containment, you could have a spill kit on site and you could say this spill kit is our secondary containment because we can deploy that spill kit and stop a discharge or you could have a spill response team, uh, or a drain cover that you could place over a drain. There are many different types of secondary containment. We'll go over a few of them here. So many of uh, your larger tanks are going to be double-walled tanks. <clears throat> so there's an inner shell that holds the liquid, uh, and then there's interstitial space between the inner shell and the outer shell. So if you have a leak, it's contained. Uh, by the outer shell and then there's typically interstitial monitoring where you can tell if you've had a leak um, and if that inner tank has been compromised. Precast concrete or even poured concrete or steel containment units are very common. So the precast concrete units come in many different sizes. Um, just finding one that fits uh, what you need for your tank size and your containment capacity and we commonly see um, kind of steel containment boxes that are fabricated specifically for certain tanks. Containment pallets are very common for your 55 gallon drums. Uh, there are many different types of containment pallets so it's important to remember that um, the rule says that you need to provide capacity for um, the size of the container plus sufficient freeboard for precipitation. Um, it's important to note that it's only for one container so you could store four drums on a pallet and because those are four separate containers you would only need to provide capac containment capacity for one of the drums plus sufficient freeboard for precipitation. So for a 55 gallon drum if it's stored inside maybe say 110 percent your containment capacity should be at least 60.5 gallons. Uh, many containment pallets hold 20, 30 gallons. Those are better than nothing, um, but they technically don't meet the requirement of the SPCC rule. 
Convault is another type of uh, double walled tank. Uh, the inner shell is a steel tank, but in this case the outer shell is concrete. And then there are hydrocarbon filters, um, which we commonly see at substations, or as I commonly know it as barrier boom. Um, this is a fabric material that allows water to filter through, um, but will solidify upon contact with oil. Uh, thus providing your containment capacity. And another common thing at substations is the uh, typical concrete containment pit, uh, where if there's a leak, it'll get held in uh, the concrete pit. And then there are uh, active types of containment, so um, a spill kit staged at a site, or a drain cover that can be placed over a drain, or having a spill response team that you could call into action if there were to be a spill. SPCC plans have certification requirements. If your facility has more than 10,000 gallons of oil, then a licensed professional engineer or PE needs to certify that plan. If a PE certifies an SPCC plan, uh, there is some flexibility that can be implemented if needed. Environmental equivalents, uh, there are certain rules that you can deviate from um, as long as equivalent environmental protection is provided. Uh, and that determination needs to be made by the PE. Um, another item is an impracticability determination. So for bulk storage containers, um, if it's deemed that the facility uh, cannot provide secondary containment, that it's impracticable, um, then there are some provisions for allowing uh, tanks not to have secondary containment, and that can be written up as an impracticability determination. And again, a PE needs to make that determination as well. There are two types of lower level tiers of SPCC plans. Those can be self-certified, so you don't need a PE to do those. Um, so that's if you have less than or equal to 10,000 gallons of oil. Uh, you need to meet the spill history requirements because the EPA does not want a facility self-certifying a plan if they're uh, repeatedly having spills. So there are some requirements for meeting uh, spill history. Um, the flexibility with the environmental equivalence or impracticability isn't allowed if you self-certify a plan. And then specifically for a Tier 1 plan, if you have no container larger than 5,000 gallons of oil. Um, so the EPA actually has a template for the Tier 1 plan. So if you have less than 10,000 gallons of oil, you meet the spill history requirements, you don't have a container larger than 5,000 gallons, you could go online today, download the template, and write your own SPCC plan. Um, and even for a Tier 2 plan, uh, the EPA doesn't have a template, but you can prepare your own plan and certify it. Um, oftentimes, um, owners will still want a PE to prepare a plan for them to ensure that it's done uh, properly and correctly, and that's completely fine as well. So things change at facilities. So if something changes that affects the oil storage at the facility, the SPCC plan needs to be amended within six months of the change. If that plan was certified by a professional engineer, then a professional engineer must certify technical changes. Administrative changes can be made without a PE update. So even if you have a PE certified plan, um, but the, the emergency coordinator gets a new phone number, that's an administrative update that you can make uh, without the need of a PE to recertify that plan. Uh, if there are technical changes though, if your oil storage changes, something changes with your secondary containment, something that affects uh, your oil capacity or the uh, chance of you having an oil discharge, then a PE needs to certify the change. So notwithstanding amendments made due to changes, the plan must be reviewed at least once every five years. Um, and that's in place just to make sure you do catch anything. So sometimes things change and you don't know that they've changed. So it's good to pull a plan off the shelf, uh, brush the dust off at least once every five years, that's required by the rule, and review the plan to see if you need to make any changes. So here are some things that you can do to minimize your chances for a discharge. So completing your inspections. 
So regularly inspecting your oil containers is one of the best things that you can do to minimize your chances of a spill. So look for signs of leakage. Look for signs of deterioration. Look for signs of damage. Um, identify items that may require regular maintenance. Maybe you have that tank out back. It's pretty rusty. You don't really remember how old it is. You know it's been out there for a really long time. Hey, but it's working fine. You never know if that tank's going to spring a leak. Um, so maybe it's time to swap it out for a new double-walled tank. Uh, maybe there's enough shell thickness left on the tank that you could sand it down and repaint it. Training. So annual training is required by the SPCC rule. Um, and it's important to just understand your facility's oil sources. Oil sources. Where do you store oil? How do you transfer oil? Does your staff know who to call if you have a spill? Here are some things you can do to minimize your chances of a discharge. Have standard methods for completing routine tasks. SOPs are standard operating procedures. So are there things that you regularly do that you can standardize that process to minimize your chances of having a spill? Uh, so one of the most common things that we prepare and include in plans is called an oil transfer checklist. So maybe you have a third party vendor that comes to your facility to fill up your diesel or gasoline tank. Are they following a set uh, rule of procedures to make sure that they are minimizing the chances of a discharge during that oil transfer? Use best management practices when completing oil transfers. So use a funnel when you're manually transferring into a drum. Cover that nearby storm drain. Uh, confirm you have sufficient capacity before filling. One of the most common types of spills uh, is caused by overfilling a tank. And it's uh, really common things that can be um, eliminated if we're doing these simple checks. I'm Eric Okers. I'm going to finish up this presentation that Jared started. Uh, when you're going to consider the risk of a spill, uh, there's two primary things to consider. Uh, one is what do you have? And secondly, where is it going to go? So of the spilled material for transformer sites, you might worry about uh, what's the viscosity of the material? Is it thin liquid that's going to flow readily or a really thick viscous material that's not going to flow very much at all? And then what are the other characteristics of the spilled material? Does it have PCBs in it? Is it hazardous in some other respect? Is it particularly flammable? or something else that's going to present a specific threat to responding personnel or the environment. And then as far as service materials go, you want to consider whether it's a permeable surface or an impermeable surface. Is it concrete with a full containment? Is it gravel or is it concrete wall with a gravel floor? Um, is the gravel loose or compacted? Has it got fines in it? Is it going to soak up material readily or is material going to pool on the surface? Or, you know, if it gets off the site, is it going to be in a grassy vegetated area or is it going to be on a street that it's going to run some distance before it reaches another receptor? <clears throat> when you consider uh, the risk of a spill, will the spill be contained on the property? Is it going to be fully contained within the containment or is there containment at all? And is the size of the containment adequate for the amount of spilled material? Or in the case of fire, if you have firefighting water added to uh, the spilled liquid, will the containment contain both what was in the equipment and the firefighting water or other materials applied to extinguish the fire? Um, if it does get off-site, what are the nearby pathways? Are there storm or sanitary sewer inlets nearby? Are there ditches or culverts nearby that's going to convey the spilled material directly to a waterway, or is it perhaps the substation itself uh, located directly adjacent to a waterway where uh, the spilled material could uh, impact service waters nearly immediately? Uh, in terms of what you can do uh, ahead of time to be prepared for a spill, evaluate your oil sources. Um, are they well maintained? Are, are there evidence of small stains that could be a precursor to a larger release? Uh, do they have secondary containment? Is that contained? Was a hole made in the deck to bring in some equipment and not repaired? Or if it's a, just a gravel berm, has it eroded over time so it's no longer providing full capacity? Um, review what you have in your plans. Uh, does your plan make sense? Are, are the people who need to implement the plan familiar with it? Do they know what they need to do and who to contact? 
And do you have the materials on hand to respond to a spill? Do you have spill kits? Are they ready to go? Do they need refilling? Have they been cannibalized for other projects? So uh, when you're doing your annual um, updates, you should at least at that frequency check to see if your spill kits are um, in good shape and have what they need for, your, for a release that might happen. Uh, furthermore, from a training point of view, uh, does your staff know what to do? Um, do they know where the sources of oil are in the property, whether it's a large source, potentially a large transformer tank or smaller switch gear or other equipment? Uh, and do they know who to call both within your organization, if it's after hours, who the after hours contacts are? Do they know who to call from a local emergency responders and also from the notification of spills uh, viewpoint uh, do they know how to contact date contact DNR and the um, other spill uh, response agencies that might have to be involved um, in your plan are the contacts up to date are all the oil sources um, listed correctly with the right volume and contents uh, have you upgraded a transformer from PCB to non PCB or is there another some other change at the facility that should be updated in your spill plan uh, when a spill is happening uh, you want to assist the potential risks such as fire, explosion, electric shock. Uh, obviously, when you see something spilling on the ground from a spill perspective, our tendency is to want to try to contain that. But before we proceed with that part of it, we want to make sure that the personnel who are going to be involved aren't going to be putting themselves in greater danger uh, from something that could happen during the spill response, such as a flash flyer or you know some kind of gross uh, chemical exposure or, or electric shock, certainly in the case of an energized substation. Um, you want to determine the source of the material. Is it a relatively small piece of switch gear? Is it the entire transformer tank that's let let go? Um, you know the size of the spill, in terms of what the source volume is, um, whether or not PCBs are present, and where it's going. You should have an emergency contact for the facility, and obviously they should be not notified right away, and it should be clear from the conversation with them if they're going to notify additional responding authorities or if the person on site is going to be responsible for that. Um, the people who are responding uh, from utility or other first responders should make sure they have the appropriate personal protective equipment and they should do what they can to stop the spill from spreading. Now that may not be getting directly in contact with the spilled material. In some cases it's not safe to approach directly but if you can have some familiarity of where the uh, drainage is going, it may make more sense to place booms or temporary um, dams or dikes downstream, down gradient from the, the release to prevent the material from migrating off-site or moving very far off-site. Um, the next step would be if you have a waterway that's impacted, placing materials to um, prevent the spill from moving downstream or if it's on a slack water body perhaps placing some containment booms to contain the boom to the area where the spill is initially entering the water body and then after the the um, initial containment is done then the final step uh, is the cleanup by using absorbent materials pumping removing free liquids and then typically um, scraping up or excavating uh, oil stained uh, gravel, oil saturated uh, soil, and other materials as necessary. Now when, when you have an emergency you need to know who to call. Um, typically in any kind of emergency the best number to call right away is 911. You may have a procedure that requires facility personnel to be notified first and that's fine but 911 should be called as, as quickly as possible. Um, it's not a bad idea to get a spill response contractor called fairly early on in the process because depending on where they have to come from, there may be a several hour delay in their arrival. So if you know that you've got a contract with somebody or that you're going to need somebody, it's best to make that contact early. Certainly if you know you have a um, release that's getting into a sanitary sewer that might affect a wastewater treatment plant, you should contact the operator of the plant as quickly as possible so they know to look for it and may be able to make 
accommodations to hold that material before it gets into their system if that's going to be a concern for them. And then uh, certainly you need to notify if the material has been released from a containment or is in a containment that is permeable, such as just a gravel floored uh, dike, you need to notify the Wisconsin Spill Hotline, and that number is 800-943-0003, that's staffed 24-7. And if you have a service water body that's impacted, you also need to notify the EPA Coast Guard National Response Center. That number is 800-424-8802. So we have a small um, spill scenario here, a spill on an impervious surface. Uh, this particular example shows what probably is uh, engine oil or hydraulic oil on an impervious surface. And this individual is applying absorbent material to the spill. Uh, before you actually jump in and start working, you still want to assess the potential risk. Is this something that even can come, comes in contact with you is going to create problems? Uh, you know, typical mineral transformer oil is not that aggressive in terms of causing personal injury, but if it happens to be an acid or some other aggressive material, you want to be aware of that before you start coming in contact with it. Um, it's always best to stop the source of the spill before you start the cleanup. Make sure you've got the right protective clothing, whether it's fire resistant clothing or and or chemical protective gloves, perhaps a full chemical protective suit or whatever is necessary, depending on the material that's spilled. Um, you can clean up the spill with absorbent materials and notify the facility emergency contact with the uh, information about what material was spilled, the volume it was spilled, how it was contained and what the present situation is. In this case, we have a little bit more uh, difficult scenario where this was a uh, voltage regulator that failed on an outside, obviously, it's outdoor substation onto a gravel area in the wintertime where the ground was frozen, so very little actually soaked in, but a lot of the material ran off because it couldn't penetrate uh, the ground and some of the force of the explosion propelled oil outside of the uh, containment area that was there. In this case, you also want to assess the risks of um, to not only responding personnel, but to the environment. Notify the appropriate personnel, the the, uh, the company contact, and also the, the emergency responders. You want to place human health and safety as a priority. So again, even though something may be actively spilling, if there's a fire going on, or if there's energized equipment, it may not be possible to respond right away until the situation is stabilized. And to the extent possible, you want to control the spill pathways, whether that means plugging up storm drains or placing sandbags or sand in ditches to contain the spill material so it doesn't continue to migrate further off site. Um, after the situation is controlled, and perhaps the, the substation is de-energized, you can come in and work on your excavation. In this photo, you can see there the crew has excavated down maybe about a foot or two to uh, remove soil that's saturated with uh, mineral oil. Uh, in this case, it was necessary to stage that material prior to testing. The landfill that would ultimately receive this material needed to have confirmation that it did not have PCBs in it. So it had to be staged on site for probably two weeks for testing prior to disposal off site of the landfill. Here we have a, another scenario where we potentially have a spill that gets into a water body and this uh, particular photo is showing a, uh, a floating oil containment boom that stretched across a creek. So um, there may be personal risks involved with this. Uh, and also environmental risks. Uh, if you have swift water or a steep bank along your waterway, it may not be possible for personnel to access it very safely. You may need to have a boat, and anytime you're in the water, you need you know proper flotation devices for the people and and uh, safety procedures specific to working with water. You also need to, uh, in all cases, like we've stressed before, notify the appropriate personnel before you start working, and um, it's always good to stop the source of the spill before you actually start working on cleanup. Here we're using floating uh, oil absorbent materials to recover. In this case, this was hydraulic oil that uh, spilled into a creek. 
So if you have any questions, feel free to call uh, Jared or myself. Our contact information is on the slide. Uh, SCS Engineers does provide 24-7 spill response services for uh, areas in Wisconsin, um, and some of our other offices also provide similar services. So if you contact one of us, we can direct you to uh, the right person in our organization to help you out. And also, by all means, in your, in your planning process, feel free to give us a call. Thanks for your attention.